So what they did at Daiichi, they reduced the height of the cliff uh, to the water to make the first that first reactor. They had a very short tsunami wall that was unable to protect anything. It was only about 13 feet high, and most tsunamis average around 13 meters, which is about 46 feet. The diesel generators were placed in the basement in the path of the rising waters. They should have been in waterproof containment. And the emergency pumps or the service water pumps that were located on the shoreline were not submersible pumps. Uh, they could have cooled the diesel engines if anything had happened, but that didn't happen. And then uh, the diesel fuel tanks were placed in the floodplain, and then the containment of the Mark I wasn't able to contain. The initial cliff there was 115 feet high. They cut it down to 33 feet to build Daiichi. And again, these were the New York City engineers for General Electric and they had no idea about the tsunami. So when the earthquake hit, that sunk the earth 3.3 feet right after the earthquake. Then the tsunami came. It was averaging around 15 meters, but actually at its peak, it hit when it hit the shore, it was 46 meters, which is about 135, 140 feet high. So it went over the top of the plant's building. And there have been a history of many tsunamis hitting Japan. Uh, and he went back over the history, and most of them were about 13 meters. The worst one was in 1933, the Senriku. Uh, that was 28 meters on average, and that was the killer tsunami of record until Fukushima. And the um, secret, he said, of the problem was in the assumptions that the containments maintained their integrity, which they didn't, because you have this tsunami coming at you that's going greater than the speed of sound, so no, no containment in the world is designed to handle what's called a detonation shockwave from a tsunami traveling fa faster than the speed of sound. And we have 440 nuclear reactors in the world, and none can handle the, such a shockwave because engineers believed it couldn't happen when they were designing the nuclear reactors. And right after the accident, Chuck Costo, who's in charge of the NRC, said, of course, that Mark I containment is the worst one of all the containments we have. And it's literally, you know, this NUREG tells you that it's in a station blackout, you're going to lose containment. And there's no doubt about it. That's what happened. So units one, two, one, three, and 4 exploded, and um, the containment exploded on Unit 2, the third unit had MOX fuel, which has plutonium in it. There were 14 reactors at four plants altogether, actually, uh, that were in danger of melting down. And um, but since the accident, there are now three million data points in Japan, and the United States uh, scientists who were testing the levels were, were getting levels ten times higher than their Japanese co uh, uh, cohorts doing the test right beside them on their different gunga counters or whatever machines they were using. The other question was about containment leak leakage, and uh, this wasn't supposed to happen, but the bolts started to get loose, and then the water had been boiling inside, and then they, they saw that they had a picture of red, a red area where steam was coming. It wasn't steam, because it was, it was red, and he felt that this was another kind of gas that was actually burning, it wasn't water that was, would be a different color. So all the water had boiled out of the reactor on the inside and was leaving the containment. And normal leakage is about 1% loss every um, day. But they were losing, they actually lost from the data 300% every day, which means every eight hours they were turning over 100% of all the air inside the reactor and whatever radiation was in it was going to the environment. And all the noble gases were released. Uh, they noted that the background radiation, as measured on the surviving four uh, detectors, showed the background radiation should have been 0 0.04 to 0 0.05 microsieverts per hour. 
And by 10 o'clock in the morning on March 12th, the accident occurred on the 11th, it was up to 37 microsieverts per hour, which is 720 times the background. Then the vents finally were open at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And by 3 o'clock, it was up to 30,000 times the background radiation. And they measured that in a town called Chiba. And another thing about what was going on there was that the hot particles, in other words, like plutonium and little particles that you don't, you don't measure easily with a Geiger counter, uh, were being uh, released also. You release all the radionuclides from a plant. So what Arnie did was, Arnie Gunderson, he took a bag of samples through customs that he had collected by school, took five samples, and they tested them at, at Worcester Polytech, and each of the samples exceeded 7,000 becquerels per kilogram, which qualifies as radioactive waste in the United States at 7,000 disintegrations per second of cesium. And this was in Tokyo, which is around 150 miles away from the accident. And so people in Tokyo are walking around with spots that have radioactive waste right along the sidewalk, and there's concentration on kids' shoes that they also did a study on, and the kids tie the shoes with their hands and then they eat, and then it gets into their gut and then they're contaminated. They also did some tests on car filters, and uh, they found that the car filters are like your lungs, and basically they were standing on an x-ray plate, and so uh, that showed that the radiation was being inhaled all over Tokyo and all over the northern part of Japan. Tokyo, Tokyo is about 150 miles south, 155 miles south of Fukushima on the north east coast of Japan. Um, what else? He also said that um, there are about 35 million people in Tokyo and they're being exposed there. Remember that in the United States we upped our exposure back to background radiation from 200 and now it's over 600, but really it should be around 200. But the latest thing they're trying to do is do a thing called the um, PAGS, or Protective Guidelines for Radiation After an Accident. It was supposed to be after a dirty, a dirty bomb or a nuclear accident from a, bom a bomb. But then they decided to conclude nuclear power. And now they're saying, that, and also transportation accidents, when we, if we're going to start shipping nuclear waste. In other words, get ready for the new normal. They're saying that 2,000 millisieverts uh, per year is okay exposure to be cleaned up in the United States now. And that is uh, equal to 200 rems per year, which is a ridiculous amount. And um, that would cause about one person in six to develop a cancer. And the EPA has said that they really only expect radiation to be acceptable to kill somebody with cancer, give somebody cancer, one in 10,000 people, one in a million people, and now they're saying one in six is okay. So these pegs are not acceptable, but the United States is um, thinking about doing this and has put this out for citizens to comment on. Arnie also noted that uh, radioactive ash is being put into ponds that are supposed to be consolidated and over a lining, but he notes that he had a little pinhole in there that'll let 88,000 gallons of this stuff out every year. Mr. Gunderson has told us that 400 tons per day of radioactive water are being introduced into the plant from the groundwater, seeping into plant reactors. It's too expensive for TEPCO to suck all this water out. So he suggests digging a trench two feet wide, 20 feet deep, fill it with absorbent zeolite, and perhaps this can reduce the radioactivity of the water by maybe 60%. Meanwhile, 90% of the tsunami waste is not radioactive, so the Japanese are throwing it into the dumps. But when there's runoff from the dumps, the 10% that is radioactive is going into the groundwater, into the rivers, back into the ocean. So that's not a very good idea. Meanwhile, 
The New York Times reported on April 30th, 2013, that 75 gallons per minute of groundwater is leaking into the Daiichi plant and into the ravaged reactor buildings. This calculates to about 108,000 gallons per day. So they've had to build a tank farm to hold the water, which is radioactive, with tritium. They try to clean it with filters and so on, and the other 500 or 1,000 radionuclides that are created by fissioning uranium to make steam, to turn a turbine, to produce electricity, can be filtered out theoretically, but not the tritium. Now the tritium has a 12-year half-life and a hazardous life of 10 to 20 times that, which would be 120 to 240 years that you'd have to worry about the tritium. And it's the most invasive of all the radionuclides, and it can't be filtered out. It goes into your skin when you take a shower. It's absorbed that way, and when you wash the dishes. And when you eat or you drink water that has tritium in it, it goes into your body, and you also can inhale it. And the little beams of radioactivity that the tritium emit, like all problems with radiation and radioactivity, can hit your DNA and cause mutations and possibly cancer. So that's what you have to worry about. Now, TEPCO, the utility that is supposed to be taking care of the Daiichi plant and supervising the cleanup, apparently was thinking about dumping this radioactive water that would be cleaned up but isn't going to be able to be cleaned up into the Pacific Ocean. So there was such an outcry that the current prime minister in March had to say there would be no unsafe release of this water into the ocean. Meanwhile, there still could be another earthquake and other problems that, could pre that cannot be prevented if uh, nature has its way. So the tanks could crack or something else could happen and all the work that's been done can be undone as the water could leak into the ocean anyway. So Arne Gunderson leaves us with this quote which is very apropos, especially for you who would like to see a thorium reactor, foolproof, or fusion, which creates a lot of tritium. Sooner or later, Mr. Gunderson says, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. Arnie Gunderson. This is Dr. Conrad Miller, signing off of the June 3rd, 2013 Fukushima update. More Volumes of this will follow uh, David Lockbaum and the two Navy quartermasters who are suing TEPCO because they were on the USS Ronald Reagan and were not informed that Fukushima happened. They just heard about the tsunami and the earthquake, so they thought they were just going to help people with food and supplies. We'll talk about that in the next video.